bonding. Why do bonds form at all? When bonding occurs, there are two basic processes that are going on. One, valence shells of the atoms are getting filled or emptied. Two, energy is lowered when the bond forms. If the energy is not lowered when the atoms form a bond, then the atoms will not stay together, since one of the fundamental principles of matter is to have the lowest energy it can. And if the atoms have lower energy when apart, they will stay apart. If the valence shells are not filled or emptied, then the combination will probably not be stable and will usually continue to combine until the shells are filled or emptied. So while molecules like OH do exist in outer space, where atoms are relatively rare, they tend not to exist on Earth because the molecules are too reactive to be stable. Chemical bonds occur in three different ways, which gives rise to the three different types of bonds. These three ways are an ionic bond, which involves the transfer of electrons from one atom to another to make oppositely charged ions that attract each other. A covalent bond, which involves the sharing of electrons between two atoms. Or a metallic bond, which involves the freeing of electrons from the need to be on one particular atom or molecule. We will focus on the first two types. An ionic bond is the first type. It is a transfer of electrons from one atom to another. Sodium metal is heated until it melts and just begins to burn. Then it is immersed into the yellow-green chlorine gas. The sodium begins to burn in chlorine with an intense yellow flame. It produces a white smoke of sodium chloride. We are observing the exothermic reaction of sodium metal with chlorine gas, producing the white solid sodium chloride. Afterwards, the glass spoon contains only white solid sodium chloride. The video clip showed sodium burning in chlorine to form sodium chloride, complete with flames. This results in the formation of an ionic compound, one in which an electron has been transferred from the sodium atom to the chlorine atom. In order for this to happen, the electron must be removed from the sodium atom. This process is the ionization of sodium, the energy for which, 495 kilojoules per mole, is well known and shown on the slide. The addition of the electron to the chlorine atom in the creation of the negative ion results in the release of energy. This energy is the electron affinity, which is also well known for chlorine, minus 349 kilojoules per mole. The combination of these two processes yields an overall process that requires the input of 146 kilojoules per mole of energy. The video clip shows what is clearly a reaction that gives off energy. So there is something missing here. The missing piece of the energy relation is the attraction between the newly formed sodium cation and chloride anion. The ions lose energy as they come closer together to form the solid. This energy is called the lattice energy, which is the energy required to completely separate a mole of solid ionic compound into its gaseous ions. We could also define lattice energy this way. The energy released when gaseous ions come together to form one mole of an ionic solid. 
The lattice energy is dependent on two factors that are part of Coulomb's law, shown here. The first is the charges of the ions, Q1 and Q2 in the formula. The second is the distance between the ions in the solid state, D in the formula. The larger the charges of the two ions, the greater the attraction and the more energy is released when the ions come together. We can see this by comparing the lattice energies of Kf with plus and minus one ions, CaO plus or minus two ions, and SCN plus or minus three ions, where the ions are not wildly different in size. K plus, Ca2 plus, and SC3 plus are isoelectronic, as are F minus, O2 minus, and N3 minus. Notice that the lattice energy increases as the charges of the ions increase. The distance between the ions is related to the sizes of the individual ions. The closer the ions can approach each other, the more energy is released when they do come together. If we compare the lattice energies of NaF, NaCl, NaBr, and NaI, we see that as the halide ion increases in size, which it does as we come down the column in the periodic table, because the outer electrons are in higher energy, larger valence shells. As the ions increase in size, the ions get further apart and the lattice energy decreases. So the larger the charges of the ions, the greater the lattice energy. And the smaller the ions, the greater the lattice energy. In order to complete the picture we saw in the video, we must take into account the fact that both ionization energy and electron affinity are measured on gaseous atoms. Since we started with solid sodium metal, we need to account for the energy needed to make sodium metal into gaseous ions, which requires energy. In addition, although chlorine was already a gas, it was made of diatomic molecules. So we need to add in the energy it takes to break the bond between the chlorine atoms. Since both of these processes require energy, they only make it require more energy to create the ionic solid from solid sodium and chlorine gas. Without the lattice energy, ionic bonds would not be possible. Understanding these factors helps to explain things like the octet rule. For metals, the energy needed to remove electrons increases dramatically when the valence shell has been emptied. To remove another electron requires so much more energy that the lattice energy would not be able to overcome that to produce a net loss of energy. For covalent bonding, both atoms involved attract the electrons very strongly so no transfer can occur. Instead, the atoms share the electrons in order to fill their shells. If we look at the simplest molecule, H2, we have four particles present. Each electron is attracted to both protons. The two electrons repel each other, as do the two protons. So we have four attractions and two repulsions we need to deal with in the molecule. When two hydrogen atoms approach one another, weak attractive forces operate between them. As they approach more closely, their 1s orbitals overlap more extensively and covalent bond formation occurs. As the atoms move still closer together, the electron pair that forms the bond does not effectively screen the nuclei from one another and nuclear-nuclear repulsion becomes more important. The minimum energy structure in which the nuclei are separated by 0.74 angstroms 
corresponds to the best compromise between nuclear repulsions and the attractive interactions between the electrons and the two nuclei. The video showed what happens to the energy of the system as two hydrogen atoms approach each other from extreme distance. Because the electrons and protons attract each other, as they get closer together, the energy drops, as in going from position 1 to position 2 on the graph. But the repulsions increase as well, as the two nuclei come closer together, and as the two electrons spend more time in the same region in space. At some point, the forces of repulsion and the forces of attraction are equal, position 3 on the graph. Then, if we push the two nuclei closer together, the energy of the system increases fairly rapidly to position 4 and beyond. But to pull the two nuclei apart also requires energy. So the two nuclei sit at a certain distance apart, which is where they have the minimum energy. For hydrogen, this happens to be at a distance of 74 picometers, or 0.74 angstroms. This is called the bond length for the hydrogen molecule. The energy released when the two atoms come together, 432 kilojoules per mole, is called the bond energy. This is also the energy needed to break the bond. When atoms are identical, both atoms have an equal pull on the two electrons in the bond. In that case, the electrons are shared exactly equally, as they are in fluorine, shown on the left in the diagram. But if the two atoms are not identical, then it is likely that they will not pull equally on the two electrons, as in HF. The fluorine atom pulls on the electrons more strongly than the hydrogen atom does. So the fluorine end of the molecule will have a higher electron density than the hydrogen end. The fluorine end will be slightly negative and the hydrogen end will be slightly positive. Electronegativity is the measure of how strongly an atom pulls on the electrons in a bond. Electronegativity can be thought of as a combination of the ionization energy and the electron affinity, and so changes in the same way that those two quantities change. That is, electronegativity increases as you go from left to right across the table, and as you go from the bottom to the top of a column. Because the noble gases do not tend to form compounds, they generally are not given electronegativities. The most electronegative element is fluorine. It's a good idea to memorize that. Next comes oxygen, and then nitrogen and chlorine. When two atoms have unequal electronegativities, then the electrons spend more time around the atom with a greater electronegativity, and we have a bond dipole. That is, there is a separation between the centers of positive and negative charge for the bond, because of the unequal distribution of the electrons. The bond is polar. This is a polar covalent bond. The measure of the polarity of the bond is called the dipole moment, measured in Debye's. It is related to the difference between the electronegativities of the two atoms. The greater the electronegativity difference, the more polar the bond. This can be seen in comparing the electronegativity differences and dipole moments of the molecules HF, HCl, HBr, and HI as seen in the table. As the electronegativity difference gets larger, the dipole moment gets larger. The dipole moment is a vector quantity which means that it has a direction as well as a magnitude. The direction of the bond dipole is always from the element with the lower electronegativity toward the element with the higher electronegativity.